heading back, uh, we had a few things to take care of. Uh, we will pick up the afternoon then, uh, continuing the discussions at Constellation. Uh, who will be the first uh, briefer this afternoon? Steve, are you the first briefer yes, this sir. afternoon? Okay, let's bring up uh, first chart, please. Next chart. So we've got uh, just a couple of wrap-up topics that I think are important uh, for the uh, panel to hear. We'll talk through progress that we've been making on our uh, key risks, our risk mitigation activities. Dr. John Hutt, who's our chief engineer for overall vehicle integration, will walk you through that. We'll talk about our development flight test, Ares 1X, uh, give you an overview of Ares 5, where we stand with that and its capabilities and some, some options, and then I'll wrap it up with a short summary. So with that, Dr. Hutt. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm back from lunch and ready to go. Um, uh, before I jump in, I just want to uh, let everybody know how much I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to come and uh, talk to the committee on the technical issues. Uh, really appreciate from the, the role I have in, in engineering to come and sort of spearhead the uh, effort and speak for engineering on uh, what we do to drive out these technical issues and, uh, and go resolve them. So with, the, with that, the uh, first chart. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of discussion today about the technical risks of this development of Areas 1 today. Good conversation. And uh, just to continue on that theme, uh, launch vehicle development, we all know we're building uh, high energy systems with limited margins. We know we're going to have technical challenges. Each vehicle we build has unique technical challenges, and uh, we're set up in our organization to go off and work those. Uh, we do that through a rigorous uh, risk management uh, system approach where uh, we identify these risks, set up mitigation plans, and get put resources on the problems. And what I'm going to give you today is a quick snapshot. The big technical challenge is 15 minutes if we've got any. Um, a quick uh, snapshot of where we are today on our issues. And if you talk to me in a month, what's uh, on the radar screen, I think is going to change quite a bit. In fact, some of these in my mind are ready to fall off. We're going to talk through. Uh, First stage thrust oscillation, you all heard quite a bit about that. I'll give you a quick status of where we are on that. Uh, the liftoff uh, clearance issue, you've probably heard some about that, which is primarily driven by the availability requirements, and we'll tell you where we are on that. Separation system power shot, we'll talk step systems. Uh, we all know launch vehicles. The separation system is something we have to be very careful about because it's so easy to get into problems there, and we'll talk latest where we are there. We we'll talk uh, the vibroacoustics problem, which has been mentioned a couple of times earlier today, and where we are on that problem, which is probably where the, is my key focus area right now uh, from our engineering focus. And we'll talk payload mass performance. Particularly this area we'll talk because of the fact that fixing all these other problems tends to impact mass performance. That's what, uh, from a performance standpoint, how we pay for those problems. And again, we expect to be retiring these, and new ones will pop up, so we'll show you where we are. Okay, next chart, please. Thrust oscillation. Um, in order to kind of reap the benefits of this vehicle configuration, we gave ourselves a one challenge we had to go work. We put the uh, solid motor in line uh, with the vehicle structure. So now we have a, basically an acoustic resonator, if you will, in line with a flexible structure. Classic dynamics problem. So we got to go address that problem. And the real technical challenge here, from our perspective, is not the structural limits of the vehicle. Um, it's not the crew health limits we've talked about. Those are, are very easy to get to, to limits um, where we don't have a problem. The issue is when we, uh, in certain parts of the burn, uh, the modes get very close, we uh, can get on resonance, and we potentially have issues with uh, oscillations that affect the crew situation awareness, their ability to read displays, operate, and do the functions that they need. And they actually, they're very sensitive to that, and they need very low levels. A lot of ways to solve the problem. We've got a host of solutions. Our engineers love this problem, actually, because we keep finding different ways to solve this problem. Um, and, but we're trying to get the, mo the simplest solution, and what we've chosen to do the simplest way to work the problem is simply detune it, is get the forcing function and the response 
uh, uh, frequencies away from each other, separate the frequencies. That's what we've chosen to do. So next chart. Uh, a lot of information on this chart. But the point here is back in June, uh, we met with the program, uh, selected a baseline, relatively simple baseline of a spring uh, in the middle of the vehicle and one below Orion. We were working the analysis of this system in parallel with the crew doing testing to really kind of hone in on exactly where those sensitivity limits were for their situational awareness. We all came together and looked at uh, where we were from the ability of that system and where we were from where recommended requirements. Well, they recommended requirements of 0.21 G uh, root mean, mean square averaging for the, uh, uh, the oscillation in the 0.7 G peak. Well, when we looked at uh, our system and compared to that, and they wanted that at a, at, to be able to meet that with a three sigma 99.86 probability. Our initial analysis said we could get to a 93.8% probability with the current structure as we know it now, which is evolving, by the way. One of the issues that we work is the dynamic response of the vehicle will, will evolve. Um, so, and we are also looking at structural change that we could do and say, well, this is a good place to set a baseline design and they'll start looking at some of the changes Orion could do on their side to drive that probability up to 99.86 and also be refining our models. Well, we've done model refinement since then and actually the 93.8% is already up to 95.4 before we've done any structural changes. So this design is progressing. It's a relatively simple design because we're essentially putting springs in at the interface. Now the interface designers say, well, that's not so simple, of course, but it's design work and, and, and it's uh, very doable. We've got concepts in place. Uh, so, next chart, if you will. Now, in the event we don't get there uh, or get ourselves comfortable that we've got limits that the, we can uh, come to closure with the, with the crew office and, uh, and get the requirements we can solidly lock down, we have a number of other solutions. And you heard about lock snamper, which has been mentioned earlier. We really like this solution. It's a very robust solution. It's very simple. It does a lot for us from the standpoint of, of um, uh, well, detuning and absorb, absorbing using the mass of the propellant tank. It's a very elegant solution that, that we think we like it a lot. The issue is to do the prudent work here. It was a very low TRL when we started. It's rapidly coming up the TRL curve. We'd like to get there as soon as possible. Um, our engineering team loves the solution. It's very powerful. Also, we have, um, have had for some time an active system that basically does force cancellation and uh, totally wipes out the, or essentially wipes out the, the, uh, the forcing function which is there and we're just trying to avoid the cost and complexity of that implementation but very feasible design. So we feel like we've got a host of ways to solve this problem. We're trying to get the simplest, least impact to the program solution. So from a technical standpoint, uh, I think we have this problem well in hand. Okay, next chart. Uh, Liftoff clearance. When we started, our initial uh, uh, trajectory profile was to lift off the vehicle essentially straight up and go into active control once we cleared the stand. Where our requirement was to do this with a 34 knot wind blowing from the south into the stand. Well, in some of our probabilistic cases, that showed recontact with the stand. Uh, not uncommon for, uh, for vehicles to have to deal with this problem. The 34 knot wind is pretty unique to us because we're trying to get um, as much availability as we can out of the system. Well, from very simple fixes of doing command biasing and turning on active, active control, excuse me, as soon as we get out of the hole, uh, we're, we're able to fix this problem and meet all of our recontact requirements. So recontact, in my mind, is not a significant issue. What remains to be worked now is as we fly the vehicle uh, out, we've got to look at the plume impact on the stand so we don't do enough damage to the stand so it affects our ability to refly. So now we're going into the mode of looking carefully on where the limits will be on stand damage from the plume. The 34 knot wind is still a concern and I suspect we will probably wind up placarding winds from that one direction from the south so that we don't um, have to do so much uh, fly off biasing that we damage the, the, uh, the tower. We've looked at the amount of placarding that it takes to, uh, uh, to be able to prevent plume damage and it looks like it's actually going to be a minor uh, impact to overall 
uh, launch availability. So I don't see this problem as that significant of a concern. Um, and it's mainly here in my mind because it's, it's, it appears to be a significant concern. In my mind, it's not that really. Okay, next chart. Uh, separation system power shot. We've done extensive work on our separation system for this vehicle. Great deal of analysis to ensure that we get um, clean separation. Uh, in fact, we've had an ind independent study uh, performed by uh, Aerospace Corp, in fact, and uh, basically um, agreed with our basic results. We have a robust separation system overall concept design. The issue that, we, that it did drive us to is because of packaging constraints on avionics, we had a very large linear shaped charge to ensure we got a very clean separation. One thing we have to be clean is we don't hang up when we separate. So um, we had a very large charge, initial analysis to ensure that we, uh, uh, that we separated the system. And in, in the near field, we had avionics boxes see, seeing very high um, uh, G-load shocks from that, unacceptable G-load shocks from the standpoint of what we could practically uh, qualify for avionics. Just recently, I think within the last two weeks, we have changed that design to a frangible joint design using uh, it's now I think 30 grains per uh, linear foot frangible joint, which also has a much lower shock load. Um, so the uh, shock load to the avionics boxes is now more than an order of magnitude lower than it was um, in the previous design, well below where we see historical issues with shot loads on avionics components. So I think uh, essentially we've got the only open issue here from re fully retiring this is getting that design maturity for frangible joint up to where it was for the linear shaped charge. Okay, next. Uh, okay, the vibroacoustics issue. Uh, this is one where we've got, we got a lot of focused effort on right now. And this one's going to be more of a long-term effort because it's going to move around on us as we mature the vehicle. Uh, the nature of this vehicle is we fly a high dynamic um, Q, um, dynamic pressure trajectory in this vehicle, uh, which means we go, and we go transonic, very low in the atmosphere, so we have pretty high acoustics during uh, in transonic. Uh, which leads us to high vibroacoustic loads. Now, a lot of launch vehicles typically have high vibroacoustic loads. So ours are somewhat higher than typically seen, um, but it, very much at manageable levels. Um, now, we're we got to attack this problem at at all levels in our, our mind to get the cleanest overall system solution. The first thing that uh, we're going to focus on and are focusing on is our predictive methods and do we have adequate resolution of the key areas uh, in our wind tunnel testing? Are we appropriately transferring that, those acoustic results to the vibroacoustic predictions that the designers have to use to design their environments to? And are, are they adequate, adequately bracketing what we're gonna see in flight but not bracketing more so, so that we're stressing uh, our, our uh, our designs are stretching where we have to design more than we need to. The thing that we have been doing and have probably exercised as great as we possibly can is what can we do from the vehicle perspective? How do we? How can we fly the trajectory differently? Um, can we uh, put limits on angle of attack that will help? Those kind of things uh, from how we fly the vehicle, and uh, are the things we can do from a protuberance standpoint smooth out the mow line to get these. Uh, uh, noise levels down. Once we've exhausted those, and of course this is an iterative activity, once we've exhausted those, we then go into uh, what we can do at the component level. Okay, next chart. Uh, a lot of things we can do. You can move the components, we can isolate, we can do absorption, uh, and we can increase the effective mass. Uh, Vibrocoochies is very much uh, mass driven. If we can get the effective mass of the component up by either combining them, add mass, change how you mount them, we can get the overall acoustic levels down. That's where we're working right now. We've done all of that. We've worked the um, instrument unit, avionics, with, and have got now the levels down well within where we can uh, qualify the components. The issue now is on the reaction control system and the roll control system. Right now the limits based on the current way we're mounting uh, those systems 
exceed where the heritage qualifications are for those issues. Now that is a significant concern to the designers and we are looking at our design options. We have a wide design space on how we can fix that problem from anything as far as how we mount um, the RCS system to uh, redesign the RCS system in the most extreme level. So, and we're working through those. All right, next. Okay, and when we get to the mass issue, where are we relative to mass? Um, it, we've been watching this problem for, or not really a problem, we actually had the luxury of designing in a robust um, uh, level of margin from the standpoint of we're using historical mass growth allowances, allocating that to the elements. Uh, they're well within the historical growth curves um, for, for those elements. Plus we have margin uh, at the project level that we've been managing uh, quite well and we've got on the order of uh, uh, 2,000 kilograms margin above mass growth allowances that the elements have uh, for the ISS mission and there's some 600 or so kilograms less than that for the lunar mission so we think we're in a robust state from the standpoint of payload capability. Uh, last chart. Uh, in, in summary, I can't, I've gone through the ways we're attacking all of these uh, problems. I think we're in relatively good shape. And um, as I wrap up here, we'll be turning this over to um, Steve Davis, the Deputy uh, 1X project manager. And t there's two key problems that we're going to get critical data for uh, on these issues from 1X, one being uh, thrust oscillation data. We'll get a great data point first time we've flown an inline vehicle. We'll, we'll do predictions on that, see if we're actually matching our models, and we'll get more data on the vibroacoustic environments to see if our correlations are, are actually working well. So um, very important test coming up, and um, Steve will lead us right into that. Thank you, John. It's a, uh, it's a real pri uh, uh, privilege to uh, speak to the committee. Uh, I just have two charts. I understand tomorrow you'll be at Cocoa Beach, and the mission manager, I'm the deputy mission manager, Bob S. will be down there. And um, I would suggest if you have an opportunity, the hardware is over in the VAB at KSC. And we have begun stacking, and it's well worth your time, I, I suggest, for you to, if you get a chance to go see it. Next chart. As I said, I have two charts. One is a, an overview of the flight test, and the second is a, is a status. This, uh, we are flying a suborbital vehicle. It's uh, essentially, we, we have a four segment uh, RSRM with a fifth segment uh, uh, spacer so that the uh, first stage uh, has the same uh, characteristics as the Ares 1X, or the Ares 1 uh, first stage, and the upper portion of the vehicle is essentially uh, a metallic simulator. We're flying about not, uh, we're 750 or so sensors. We're going to get 900 measurements back. That's in addition to all the uh, uh, flight uh, or uh, operational flight instrumentation data that you would get from just flying the vehicle. There are five pr uh, primary objectives. They're listed here in blue. We're going to demonstrate controllability. As you can imagine, this rocket is very tall. It's almost 330 feet tall. It's 18 feet at its max width, and so there is a it a, has a very high slenderness ratio, and so we're interested in understanding the controllability as part of the risk mitigation for Ares-1. We're also interested in, in separation. You've heard that uh, come up earlier today. At uh, 130,000 feet, which is about two minutes into flight, we will uh, perform our, our first separation. It's our primary separation. There's a second, a smaller one when the uh, primary chutes come out a little later. Uh, the, our third uh, objective is to demonstrate the assembly and the recovery of the uh, first stage. We're going to demonstrate that uh, we can go and recover it as part uh, of risk mitigation for Ares 1. Number four, we're going to look at the stage, uh, the first stage uh, reentry dynamics uh, after we've uh, separated and as we um, um, turn on the tumble motors and eventually trim out and, and produce the chutes. And the fifth thing is to, uh, to characterize the integrated uh, vehicle roll torque. Interestingly, the roll um, control modules we have are essentially decommissioned peacekeeper, uh, or large portions of them are from de decommissioned peacekeeper parts, including the tankage as well as the thrusters, but we've reconfigured them to, to work with our vehicle. Next chart. 
I could go through a lot of details on, on our status, but I think the easiest way to look at it is this. All the main hardware is down at KSC now. We have, we're occupying two bays in the, vertical, or in the vehicle assembly building, High Bay 4 and High Bay 3. High Bay 3 is where the mobile launch platform is and where we have already stacked the motor segments, which we call Stack Zero. There are five sub-stacks that then go on top of it. And we made the decision just yesterday, last evening actually, to be in stacking of the upper portion of the vehicle. So the expectation is that in about two to two and a half weeks or so, the vehicle will be stacked and we will begin the process of, of integration, uh, of, of test out and integration, uh, electrical integration. Um, you've heard that uh, we have adjusted our schedule to October 31st. Uh, actually, internally, we're working to October 17th, uh, and the reason why we've adjusted that is uh, we had some issues with the uh, with uh, shuttle conflicts, but more than that is we've added additional time to do our testing of the integrated vehicle, all the electrical testing, and we've, we've made that six weeks long and double shift so that we have time to work through any issues that may come up, and certainly from a first-time vehicle, we're expecting to see some things. So uh, with that, um, I think that's a, uh, an overview, and I think tomorrow when you're down at Cocoa Beach, I believe the mission manager will spend a little bit more time going through the details of it. And uh, following me is Steve Creech, who uh, is in charge of our Ares 5 development. Thank you, Steve. So you've been through the Ares 1 that's in development, and Steve just showed you Ares 1X. It's about to go to flight test. I'm going to tell you about our take you back to the concept definition stage and tell you about the work we're doing on Ares 5. Go ahead. This is our point of departure vehicle that we established at last year's mission concept review. It was a mission concept review for not only Ares 5, but the entire lunar architecture. The vehicle is a 10 meter diameter vehicle, same as the Saturn V first two stages that are in the, in the room behind us here. Uh, the core stage is, has six RS-68B engines. We fly with a five and a half segment version of, this, of the solids. This actually derived from the Ares-1 first stage and adds a uh, half segment. We've also traded for longer term options going to, uh, to new uh, solids and we're also actively trading, actually staying with the current uh, design of the Ares-1 first stage, a five segment. The Earth departure stage uh, serves as the second stage for the launch vehicle. It then loiters on orbit for up to four days, uh, provides station and keeping for the whole stack, power, attitude, um, keep, tries to keep from burning off all its propellants, and then uh, does the TLI burn to go to the moon with Altair. And then you see um, the, the payload shroud that encap encapsulates the lunar lander, Altair lunar lander. Next chart. You've seen this today, and, and I know it's been a recurring message, but I wanted to hit again that the, the family nature of Ares 1 and Ares 5. Um, for reliability reasons that we get experience with the hardware, but also really driven by cost, we cannot afford two unique vehicles. And so uh, the selection of hardware, uh, not only for Ares 5, but or I would say the selection of hardware for Ares 1 was driven in large part of the requirements of a heavy lift vehicle and what we needed uh, to go back and do lunar exploration. First one I'd mention is J2X. Uh, you saw that today. Uh, the EDS wants an engine in this thrust class that can restart. Uh, the other options that are out there are to do a much lower thrust engine where you're talking about multiple engines on the stage. Um, and, and you tend to want to, to add, a add, a, add another stage in between that and the core stage. And so you're back to this engine again. Uh, but it, but it, all, all the vehicle concepts, or a lot of the vehicle concepts we've looked at really want this class of engine. So as you saw earlier today, uh, the J2X, which is past CDR, is being designed with our requirements for the heavy lift vehicle. Uh, we will then add just kidding to, to maintain, to be able to handle the on-orbit environments and then verify the restart, and that'll be as is. The first stage, um, a heavy lift, all the heavy lift kind of architectures we've looked at, to get into, certainly into a one and a half kind of class, launch class vehicle, uh, launching a heavy with an Ares one class vehicle, you, we, we believe you need an, a five segment booster. Even for a two launch, two heavy kind of launch class 
vehicle. Uh, you really want a five-segment booster uh, in, uh, to design that vehicle. And so we take that, uh, as I said, either as is from Aries 1 or, or in a configuration like adding the half-segment where you still get the benefit of using the same infrastructure. And I guess I'd say that's important. Not, those are important not only from a cost standpoint up front, but maybe even more importantly to be sustainable uh, because of the fixed cost kind of infrastructure with unique aerospace systems. Uh, we feel like there needs to be commonality there. We also use uh, on the right there, as I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, Air Force uh, Delta IV vehicle uh, core stage engine. We're using our core stage. 68 is, is flying now. Uh, 68 was, was dubbed 68A is in development, actually in test now by the Air Force and NRO. And, uh, and we, uh, uh, our version we've called 68B includes a couple of uh, operability kind of improvements to uh, address helium usage and free hydrogen and, and handle the, the different burn time requirements we have. And we think that leverages uh, obviously a commercial uh, DOD program in, in existing hardware. Uh, that we can we can share that fixed infrastructure with, and also it's it's a very producible engine, which is going to be one of the challenges of a heavy lift architecture is the core stage and number of engines that uh, rocket engines you're going to need to produce to uh, to field some of these missions. Go ahead. Some of the status, um, you know, we're, we're we're back at the concept stage, and it's it's cheap to do. Um, to look at different alternatives now, and you saw, I think, when you visited the center, uh, our advanced concept organization, some of the analysis capability we got in engineering. So we've continued to look at the different options. Option trying to find, and honestly, being driven uh, to this point mainly by cost. Meeting number one, meeting the requirements of the program and what we're trying to do uh, with the nations laid out, but secondly, by cost and looking for a more, uh, if there's a more costly. Uh, system that's also more reliable. We've done that at the concept stage, not just a running uh, post with mass fractions, but it's actually a five or six person team that does trajectory and loads and, and, uh, and um, structural design to, to come up with those in a couple of days. We also have an in-house design team of about 60 people that are focused down at the elements, looking at the next level design issues, understanding requirements, and also understanding what it takes to build and test these systems because they're so large and, uh, and that's a big part of the, the challenge too is, is how we're going to build it, how we're going to test it and what's the development plan for doing that. I've already mentioned that uh, our, our pod I showed you was from LCCR, uh, our Lunar Capability Concept Review. It was really focused on getting more margin in the overall architecture there is why we made some of the decisions for that pod. The other thing I'd point out is we've been driven uh, not just about designing a launch vehicle but working with the overall architecture and, and what the mission needs are, and those are manifested mainly for us in the Altair Lunar Lander. We've, we've also talked to, uh, spent a lot of time talking to uh, different users, uh, potential users of this vehicle. Our primary mission, of course, is NASA and, and exploration, but we've also spent time talking to astronomy and, and science and uh, DOD. Next chart. This is what they're interested in, of course, is you not only have unprecedented lift capability, but uh, volume and C3. And, and that, that allows you to use that capability to reduce the, greatly in, increase the size of payloads, reduce the time of, of interplanetary mission, inter, inter, interplanetary missions, and also removes volume constraints on, on, uh, on space telescopes. We've done several workshops and, uh, and also uh, have, uh, there was a National Academies uh, study that I've got a quote from there. Next chart. Let me finish out because I know that, you, that you're looking at different um, architectures and different options and, and, and Bo in his charts uh, mentioned Aries 5 light. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the, the different things we've looked at uh, uh, different uh, similar vehicles. Uh, on the bottom I'd only make the point you know in a 1-5 architecture we've looked at a range of, our, our, of options there depending on the, on the requirements and, and, and how they would phase in over time and how much capability you'd have. On the top, we've, we've looked at uh, the first vehicle there actually flies an Aries 1 upper stage, gets you about 35 metric tons to TLI. That is a lunar flyby with Apollo 8 kind of mission capability. Uh, 
and then and then the other two vehicles are, are what uh, Bo referred to as the uh, the Aries Five Light. That's sizing the vehicle, taking the, the same building box blocks, uh, trying you know reducing the complexity, making it uh, a little simpler using the five segment boosters, but sizing the vehicle to do the lunar mission in two launches. And the payload wants to be, if you do a dual launch kind of mission, the payloads want to be about 40 metric tons, uh, the Altair does. And, uh, and so um, we, we think you want, to, you want to size the vehicle in the 45 and, and up kind of range, and, that, and, that, and Ares 5 is uh, flexible to do that. That's my last chart. Let me turn it back over to Steve to wrap up. Mr. Chairman and the panel, we appreciate the time uh, that you've given us today to review the progress that the Ares 5 team and Ares 1 team have made over the last four years. Uh, before I get into my formal remarks, I'd like to say we did run down an action for you at lunch, and the ESAS budget line that you saw uh, was indeed the uh, submit, NASA submit to OMB in the fall of 2005. So we were able to confirm that. Could I pick up on that? It was a submit from NASA to OMB, but not approved by OMB. Uh, it was approved by OMB. That was the budget going on into 2006. Was the OMB budget, yes. the president's budget. Correct. Okay, next chart. Got two charts here to wrap it up. We've talked a lot about the people. We've talked about the hardware. But one of the other things I wanted to, to, to close on was this is not just about NASA seeking out ideas from within itself and trying to work within the aerospace community. One of the things that we've tried very hard to do is to reach out to other communities and bring in their ideas, their technologies. For example, the, the thrust oscillation uh, baseline approach today, uh, that design came from some folks that came up directly out of the automotive industry uh, as, a, as a comparison. Uh, we've been working with uh, the shipbuilding industry on how we can transfer out our uh, technology on friction stir welding so they can take it, mature it further, and then we get an even better product back. The locks dampening is something that came out of our, our engineering research community here at the center. We're working uh, closely with industry and the, and the uh, university community on coming up with large 10 meter diameter composite options for Ares 5 in particular. Uh, the payload shroud and, and we'd like to also do the interstage if we can. Uh, and that may be one piece that may be in or out of autoclave and it may also include uh, lightweight uh, fastening and joining concepts. Really trying to take the state of the art there in the aircraft world and see what we can bring over to the space lift world. And then finally, we've talked about the, uh, the uh, asbestos-free uh, insulation that uh, we are replacing uh, from, as we move from the space shuttle over. Uh, that does definitely reduce uh, environmental impact. It is a requirement to do that, but it's also turned into material that may also end up in uh, protective equipment for firefighters. So th this technology, we're trying to spin it out into the right places and also bring in the best ideas from other industries as well to solve our problems and make this the most robust solution we can. Uh, next chart. In, in closing, uh, I'd like to say that we believe that Ares 1 and 5 is the fastest and most prudent path to closing the human spaceflight gap while enabling the exploration uh, of a sustained program to the moon and beyond. Uh, it was made after a systematic evaluation of many, many concepts, uh, and we came up with what we believe is the highest reliability, safety, and lowest cost solution to meet the requirements that we were given. Uh, it's built on a foundation of proven technologies and capabilities and infrastructure. We are not uh, going after, as we did in the 90s, you know, the highest tech solution, single stage to orbit, things of that nature. The team has uh, really done an outstanding job of meeting its milestones. We have hit, we have done what we said we would do, uh, and we are well on our way towards our first flight test here in just uh, in the next couple of months, and the design of the mainline system is also well along. Ares 5, of course, is well underway. We actually have a draft request for proposal that uh, is on the street. It is on hold pending uh, your review, uh, but it is ready to go uh, at the conclusion, uh, depending on what the, uh, what the answers may come out. Ares 5 will clearly give us an unprecedented national asset, and the United States is in a unique position to enable something of the Saturn V class again. So I like to think about it, <coughs> if, as I'm sure you've had time to walk up here and see the Saturn V, just imagine that machine up there with two solid rocket boosters down the side, and you get a rough idea of, of the kind of capability we're, we're intending to enable. We are not drinking our own bathwater. There have been several external assessments of the project since we started, both uh, from the National Advisory Council, uh, NASA Advisory Council, the NASA Standing Review Board um, that has come in at every one of our reviews and has lived with us through these reviews and given us good sound insight and guidance 
as we move from step to step, in addition to the other typical government oversight boards, such as the GAO and the Inspector General's Office. So um, pleased again that we've had the, had the opportunity to talk with you today. I think you've got an idea for the three product lines that we have in work today and how we are working to actively mitigate the risk to keep this gap as short as possible. With that, I'll uh, ask for any final closing questions from the panel. Are you planning to brief the uh, material on the human exploration of Mars, or is that? That is, that is following me. That is Mr. Mr. Drake, and he is here and ready to go. Why don't we do that, then take questions all at once? Okay, that'll work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Brett. Okay. Um, what we want to do right now is just give you a feel for, you've heard a lot about the launch vehicles over the last few days, uh, Orion. Um, space station deliberations, where does this all go in terms of the future and what we might do um, as one of the goals that the, that the committee may, may consider for a future um, direction for, fu for human exploration. Next chart, please. Uh, we maintain human exploration of Mars as one of those goals um, as, as, as a challenge for us to, to guide some of our deliberations and our thinking, trying to understand how the systems, how the technologies, what we need to, to expand our frontiers beyond low Earth orbit, uh, we maintain a reference mission uh, to compare and contrast different technologies and systems and, and reference approaches. Um, it is a culmination of the best ideas we have to date. Uh, it should not be construed as the plan of going to Mars, but it is basically where we are today in, in terms of our thinking. Uh, we update it as we go along. Uh, we have just recently, in, in 2007, completed a, a study, and uh, we've... Uh, developed the documentation for that and that we've released that and given that to the committee for your, for your further uh, analysis. Um, I've extracted a few charts from that study just to give you kind of an overview. Um, and so you have a feel for how some of the systems that we're thinking about fit together. Um, next chart, please. To give you a feel for human exploration on Mars, um, it's not like lunar missions where you have an opportunity to go just about any time you want. The moon ro uh, revolves around the Earth. Uh, for Mars, you have, to, you have to concern about the rel relative phasing of the, of the uh, Earth and Mars relative to each other. And you have an opportunity to go about every 26 months. So the strategy that we employ um, is a two-phased approach. At the first injection opportunity, uh, we send cargo ahead of the crew. Uh, that cargo consists of uh, two landers. One is a decent ascent vehicle, and another is a habitat lander. And that provides us some, some several different advantages. First. It allows us to reduce the total mission mass because we're able to send that cargo on slower, energy-efficient transfers. Uh, plus, it also gives us some risk reduction capabilities in terms of we know that that cargo is in place, either on the surface or in orbit at Mars, and we know that, that it is functioning the way we want it to be functioning before we ever commit the crew to leave Earth orbit. Once the crew does leave Earth, they have no return opportunities. They're committed for a long-duration mission. So ensuring that those assets are at destination and operating the way you anticipate them to is very critical. Pre-deploying cargo also enables some revolutionary new operational concepts. Because the cargo is there, you can think about different approaches, such, such as using the resources there at Mars to enable uh, further exploration. For instance, we can extract the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We can crack it into oxygen for breathing for the crew. Plus, we can also use the oxygen for ascent off the surface. And that gives us a significant mass leverage in terms of the overall, overall architecture and how it ripples all the way through. So pre-deploying those assets gives us some robust capabilities. 26 months later, when the injection opportunity opens up for the crew, we send them on fast transits out to Mars. Uh, the fast transit is about 180 days. And if you think of it, that's basically what we're doing every time we send a rotation crew to space station. We are, in, in essence, simulating a Mars transfer. 180 days to get there. The research we're getting from space station is, station is providing us some valuable uh, lessons in terms of human conditions for those periods of time, how to, how to counteract those uh, things like bone decalcification and muscle atrophy. Uh, once the crew gets to Mars, they rendezvous with a habitat lander, descend and land, and they explore the surface for about 18 months. Again, we're waiting for the proper alignment of Earth and Mars for the return back home. So these missions are very long, and as I mentioned earlier, once we commit the crew to leaving, uh, they don't have a return capability. So reliability, 
robustness of the architecture, understanding how systems behave, and the reliability of the systems is very critical for these missions. Next chart, please. Just give you an overview of some of the in-space transfer vehicles. Uh, we're still looking at the concepts for, for, uh, for Mars transportation. Uh, the two leading concepts are a nuclear thermal rocket, and it's based off a, a technology concept that was uh, developed and actually tested in the late 60s and the early 70s, the, the rover NERVA program. And it gives us a very high specific impulse, which is good for these missions because it helps reduce the, the total mass of the vehicles in Earth orbit. Plus, it also gives you some overall architectural efficiency. Margins, there's been some discussion of margins throughout the day, and, and margins for these vehicles are going to be very important. And having an in-space transportation system, which, which is very robust, helps that margin posture. Uh, we're also looking very heavily at the chemical option, chemical combined with aero capture of the payloads at Mars, using the atmosphere of Mars for capture of, of those payloads. Uh, but those are LOX hydrogen systems uh, based on... Uh, uh, rocket technology we have in place today, for instance, RL-10 type derivative engines for the, for the major maneuvers. Um, both of those require cryogenic propellants, so storage and maintenance of cryogenics for long periods of time is critical. So these are, these are fairly large vehicles. Um, we, we tend to try to uh, minimize the amount of, of on-orbit assembly and complex operations to the, to, to the greatest extent possible um, to help improve the overall reliability of the, of the systems. Next chart, please. Now, how do Ares-1 and Orion, as well as Ares-5, fit in? Um, Ares-1 and Orion provide us two primary functions. First of all, delivery of the crew and any, uh, any checkout crew at the beginning of the mission. So that would be the Orion and Ares-1, uh, delivery of those crew to low Earth orbit. And then also at the end of the mission, uh, as, the Earth as the crew returns to Earth, we use a derivative of the, of the Orion capsule for direct Earth entry at, at the end of the mission. So Orion fits both of those bills, delivery of the crew to, to, the beginning of, at the, to the vehicles at the beginning of the mission, as well as Earth returned at the end. Uh, because we have gone with these long-stay conjunction class missions, the entry speeds back at Earth are about 12 kilometers per second, rather than lunar, which is about 11 kilometers per second. So we're real close in terms of the system requirements of Orion being able to meet those mission needs. Uh, from a mass perspective of getting all of this, this hardware into Earth orbit, uh, the total mission mass is about 800 metric tons for the nuclear option and about 1,200 metric tons for the chemical option. To put that into context, space station at assembly complete will be about 400 metric tons. So we're talking at a minimum two orders of magnitude, if not three orders of magnitude of total mission mass, and that's including the incorporation of a lot of advanced technologies. We've thought ahead of what types of technologies we want to incorporate, um, things like closing the life support system and things like that in order to reduce mass, and those have already been, to a certain extent, dialed into that mission mass. So it's a significant amount of mass. Um, for the NTR option, we need about seven to nine Ares-5 launches each time we go, the total mission mass. Um, and if we went with the chemical option, it would be on the order of nine to 12. Again, that's dependent upon the, the final end result of the, of the of the payloads and the, uh, the technologies we dialed in. Uh, maintaining a launch center, we try to, try to minimize the amount of assembly, as I mentioned earlier. And so those launches occur at about 90-day centers, uh, trying to get all those launches up into Earth orbit uh, to provide us enough, enough schedule slack, because we, we recognize that schedule slack is, is really important because we have a fixed window to, when to leave. So launching those um, on time is very critical. Next chart, please. Once the crew is at Mars, uh, we need to enable a robust exploration. Uh, we're there to explore the surface. They're there for 18 months. And so giving the crew all the capabilities and skills and techniques necessary is critical. Um, that includes maximizing the scientific return. When we land, we're going to land in fairly benign, safe locations. And we want to get to those areas of high geologic interest, which means roving long distances. So having small pressurized rovers, Having routine exploration of the surface is important. And that's another area where using in situ resources is, is critical because that can en enable us to have much more robust exploration. Plus, we want to do subsurface access, get, do, some, do some drilling, get to understand the strategy, strategy, et cetera. Um, and collaborating with scientists here at Earth. So uh, we're there for 18 months, so we can pose questions, explore, and postulate new questions to, to, uh, to enable the exploration. Next chart, please. 
Uh, in the documentation that we've provided you, we've got a long list of uh, tech key technologies and challenges. Um, just a few here that I want to mention. I won't go into much depth with these, but those that kind of the, uh, come up to the top are um, la landing large payloads on the surface of Mars. Right now, we're limited with our current technology to about two metric tons. And to enable these, we need to get up to about 40 metric tons of landed useful payload. That has been recognized as a challenge from the agency's perspective, and we're actively addressing that, um, both from an aeronautics research, science mission director, because they want larger payloads, and also from a human exploration perspective. Uh, as we mentioned, launching uh, large mass and large volume. Uh, the systems that we talk about are not just require a lot of mass, but they all re also require volume. Uh, we've got to fly these vehicles in the entry and landing through the atmosphere, which means an aerodynamic mover, maneuver. So packaging, CG control, et cetera, are very critical. Um, so when we consider the launch infrastructure and the launch process, uh, we need to also include volume as well as mass. Uh, supporting humans in space for long periods of time is critical. The, the experience we're getting, gaining from space station is, is giving us a lot of good information there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have, we don't have just-in-time supplies delivery. We have to pre-deploy either the cargo for the crew or we have to take all the necessary equipment with them. So that lack of supplies, that lack of abort capabilities, being able to enable the crew to be able to operate for long periods of time by themselves is critical. I mentioned the cryogenic fluid storage and management. Uh, production of ISR consumables, et cetera. And the bottom line of all of this is system reliability, system reliability, system reliability. Understanding the behavior of systems, understanding the failure modes and being able to predict that, understanding how to repair things uh, in space since the crew is by themselves for long periods is critical. And lastly, just to close, next chart, please. Um, kind of the evolutionary strategy that we've talked about when we, when we frame human exploration of Mars is, is ongoing today. I mean, what we're doing on the Earth in, in our laboratories, in our field tests, out in anal doing analog research at the Antarctic, in our, in our uh, desert uh, exploration, um, are all feeding into our knowledge base that we're using today. Uh, what we're doing on space station, our zero gravity research, countermeasures uh, um, protocols are vital. And as I mentioned, we're simulating every time we go to space station, to Mars transit, um, and those operational concepts. And the moon is also another critical link. Uh, as I mentioned, Mars missions, there is no return capability. So the moon serves as a valuable test bed to be able to prove those systems. Uh, we have the punch-out capability from the moon that we don't have from Mars. If things go wrong, we have the option of coming home. That's something that we don't have at Mars. So the moon serves as that viable test bed. It serves as that test bed of being able to simulate the validity of all these systems at a system-to-system -system perspective. Do they all work together on a large scale, which is difficult to do in laboratories here on Earth? So that's the large scale system to system demonstration and validation is important. Uh, plus our operational concepts. How do we explore for long periods of time with the crew is vital. And every time we send a Mars robotic program um, to Mars, we're learning from that. They're gathering a lot of the vital information that we have um, that we need in terms of the characteristics of the environment at Mars. Uh, plus we have opportunities coming up in the future with the development of Ares 5 and the need for landing large payloads on Mars. Uh, we have the opportunities to scale up our Mars robotic programs, demonstrate some subscale systems for humans, um, and, and um, tie in things like in-situ resources, et cetera. Um, so that's, there's a lot of activities going on, although not directly funded from Mars, integral throughout all of our agency activities. They're, they're, that is a focus that we try to maintain, uh, try to maintain our eye on the ball there. And that's all I have, and we'd be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you very much. I, I suspect uh, my colleagues do have questions. Anyone want to start? Unless you do it. Okay, then. Uh, yeah, my question is to, to Steve Cook, if you don't mind, Steve. Steve. Uh, you showed a, a chart near the end there about uh, 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 transition in to your program, if I can use that terminology. Uh, as you know, the National Research Council study that just came out talked about the uh, need to align uh, our civil space programs, human space flight, uh, space flight programs to address other national needs. And I'm wondering if you have uh, examples or a process here where you look at opportunities like that. The most obvious one that immediately comes to mind is your water recovery program that you have on the International Space Station. One can only imagine how that could fit not just our national needs, but needs of many, many uh, nations, particularly third world nations around the world. 
I, I think that's a, well, we'd love to take that action. In fact, we'd, we'd love just to follow up with you and, and give you some more examples. But the way we, we have done the process to date is actually we've used the, uh, NASA has a technology transfer um, uh, function that's been around for a long time. And it's been heavily focused historically on spinoff. Okay, and you, there's a magazine and a publication about how we spin off our technologies to other uses. But in the last few years, they've developed a process by which they, they look at how we spin technologies in, use them, and then kick them out, and so and then bring them back around, almost like a big figure eight. Uh, we've used that process here. We've got a, we've got a great, uh, a great uh, tech transfer folks uh, here at Marshall Space Flight Center who work with Doug Comstock up at NASA headquarters, and we've used that process. And what they do is they bring in, they, we give them a list of our key technology areas and challenges and our risks, and they go out and they work with, uh, through a series of, of other contractors that help them do this, look and see where other industries are working on those areas that we can match these up. Then they'll bring them in. We'll have a sit-down session. For example, we were getting to, uh, we, with our uh, large-scale integrated uh, ground vibration test article down here in the, the kind of a mini VAB uh, at Marshall Space Flight Center, we needed some way to be able to move up and down uh, the stack once we get it in there. The way Shuttle did it was they built individual platforms, very expensive, very time-consuming. They actually found a company, I think it was, I can't remember where the company was, but found a company that build, built systems like that for construction, and they were able to come in and, and for non-aerospace prices, okay, uh, give us some very robust solutions to get the job done. Same kind of things with Lox Damper. We, we reach out to the, to the research community there for their ideas. Um, so I, I'd love an opportunity to give you an example of, of what, how that process works and some other examples that we've looked at and some other opportunities. Would love to do that, and particularly if there's a way you can, uh, you can as part of your process, uh, interface with other uh, agencies. As an example, again, that water recovery system would right. be a tremendous need to the State Department, AID, et cetera. So I would love to follow up on that if you could. Okay, we'll do that. Any other questions? Excuse me, Chris, you had a question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Steve Creech, and it's uh, about the Aries 5. You uh, quite reasonably uh, cited the um, National Academy study on, uh, the, on how science missions, uh, high mass science missions could be enabled, high mass, high volume science missions could be, could be enabled by Ares 5. The other piece of that puzzle, of course, besides the capability is what the actual per launch cost would be and whether the science community is likely to be able to afford uh, many uh, or any such launches. So I wonder if you could tell us once the Ares 5 is in production, what you would estimate, you know, I'd be happy with one significant figure, the uh, per launch cost to be, and what are you including in that cost estimate? Our cost estimating process for both of these vehicles is, is as we've said before, highly driven by fixed costs. And we share fixed costs with Ares 1, and then we estimate what the variable cost is per launch. And to a second customer like this, we, would, we envision they would be charged that variable cost, which in 06 dollars is $300 million for the variable cost. Okay. Yeah, a quick follow-up on that one. The, the, if you look at systems that have a high fixed cost and a variable cost like that, there's breakpoints in that your, your fixed cost and your workforce are sized to support a certain number of launches and you know when somebody needs more launches per year than you're set up to do that's no longer achieved at next variable cost so do you have capacity built into the current cost estimates to support more launches than the exploration mission is projected to demand that's a good that's a good point um, the the exploration mission is sized to eventually ramp up for Ares 5 launches up to four flights per year We've even been asked to look at more than that. Most of the mission model is two flights per year. So you would want to do these uh, back in a two flight per year mission, or I think they would, you know, I guess my answer to your question is, I think, I think it fits, but you would not be able to handle, if you're flying four flights a year, you wouldn't be able to do a lot of these extra missions. And the main thing that limits that, in my mind, is going to be the engines. Um, because there, our pod vehicle's got six engines, you may have five engines, but uh, for, you know, you're talking more than 20 engines per year, and uh, and so that that'll be the flow. You know, to uh, from processing and those kind of things, I don't think it's a driver at these rates. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I had three questions. Why don't I state them all, and whoever wants to, <coughs> excuse me, answer them can be thinking about the answer. Uh, the, the first one was to ask that you would speak a little bit to the radiation risk to the crew uh, on these missions. Uh, the second question, uh, I was thinking at lunch, uh, I think you mentioned an ISP VAC of 448, which is, I think about it, sounds like an awful lot. And I'm wondering what, uh, I realize you're working off of a modified existing engine, but I, what, how confident are you of that? What test data do you have? Third question is that uh, this goes back to some experience that's not really directly relevant, and for that I apologize, but some years ago uh, when I was in the Department of Defense, uh, someone had the idea that we would uh, have a contractor develop a system and make a proven data package and then we would uh, auction it off to some other company that would put it into production. And that turned out to be a terrible idea because uh, one company's uh, engineering procedures don't match another's very well. And what are you doing to make sure that uh, the work you're doing with Boeing, I guess it's Boeing, uh, is gonna work uh, when it comes time for them to put this thing together? All right, so first question with respect to radiation. Um, radiation protection for the crew still continues to be a challenge for beyond low Earth orbit missions. Um, it is an integral part of our decision process as we, um, as we design our missions. Um, and basically, we, we continue to research several areas in terms of what is, the, what is the environment in which the crew is going to be exposed to and understanding and characterizing that, um, but also mitigation techniques uh, such as we design our vehicles to minimize the radiation effect by, um, by design in terms of the, the packaging of the systems, trying to maintain high hydrogen content systems around where the crew will spend most of their time to help mitigate the radiation effects, um, as well as minimize their exposure during the mission. Uh, for instance, as, as uh, the Mars mission, as an example, um, that was a key deci decision point when we looked at the mission classes. There's two different designs, uh, one where they stay a long period of time on the surface, and one where they spend the majority of their time in free space just chasing, and chasing Earth and Mars. Um, and there was not a discriminator from a radiation perspective. Uh, the radiation effects were essentially the same. Um, so we wanted to make the surface where the sp crew spends most of their time the safest place to be. Um, but in terms of the research, the biological effects that continues to be a major risk area that we're keeping our eyes on. Uh, no clear answers yet at this point, but we'll continue to continue to address it in all of our all of our activities. Chris, would you like to follow that up? I'd just like to ask a follow-up question. Um, not a discriminator for by radiation effects with respect to spending a lot of time on surface versus a lot of time in deep space. What puzzles me about that is that I thought that the current um, uh, limits on uh, on uh, lifetime uh, exposure uh, put you in a place where you're limited currently, uh, with our current understanding, I understand there's substantial uncertainties, to about 200 days uh, in, uh, in space. And that's the primary driver there, I believe, is galactic cosmic rays, which are hard to shield. And the advantage, of course, on being on this, of being on the surface is that you cut that by a factor of two because you have Mars behind you, so to speak. Um, and since 200 days is, you know, close, it's kind of knocking at the door, you know, it's within a factor of two or so of the amount of time you actually need to, to do a mission and uh, for the time you'll spend in space. I would think that if the factor of two would in, could, in fact, make a big difference. That, and that, that is correct. And, um, and all, of our, all of our designs so far exceed the limits. So we're, we, we are actively addressing it. Um, and in terms of our mission design of our systems, we don't have any clear answers at this point. That's why it's, you know, it's high up on our risk areas in terms of addressing. Um, no clear answers yet, but it's, it's high on our list. The next question. Uh, yes, sir. You want me to address the 448 uh, ISP for J2X? I'd appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, uh, several different uh, uh, design solutions that are, are pointed towards getting to the 448. Uh, as a reminder, the J2S uh, uh, at a 40 to 1 expansion ratio was around 436. So this is looking at about 12 more seconds. Uh, we're allowed to, uh, to uh, get the most of that from the uh, large nozzle extension due to an upper stage engine. We're going from 40 to 1 to 92 to 1. It's about 10 foot in diameter. So that's a large, large chunk of it right there. 
Uh, we're also uh, making some injector modifications that will raise the uh, C-Star up to uh, uh, over 99. And so we're making the uh, main injector much more efficient. So characteristic exhaust velocity up, uh, larger nozzle extension, and to boot, we're attempting to supersonically inject the um, turbine exhaust gas from the gas generator back down the wall of the nozzle, not only to cool the large nozzle extension, but to also gain some performance. Uh, our current power balance model shows us a nominal of over 450. And so the 448 is what we're calling the guaranteed minimum to the vehicle. So we make sure that we make our 448. Yes, sir. With regard to our transition from the NASA, uh, NASA design team development of the, of the configuration, the engineering for the configuration specification to Boeing, we have, uh, we had a plan that uh, we basically put in place before we did the acquisition that had some transition points uh, for instance, we transition manufacturing planning roughly PDR time frame. Uh, we intend to transition the design um, authority, if you will, at the DCR time frame. Uh, by that time, the NASA design will have been uh, matured to a point where the procurements are all uh, very well understood. We'll, we will have a significant amount of hardware in the flow. Uh, all of our verification qualification will be done. There's uh, two things we want out of that. One is it gives us plenty of time to work with the Boeing team to become familiar with the design so that they can take ownership of it and operate it. And secondly, it gives the NASA design team an opportunity to finish the design, complete it. We will continue to hold all of the, um, uh, the CAD models, the drawings, um, all of the specifications our NASA design team developed, they belong to the government. Now, we never intended to design valves or thrusters or the, what we call the source control items. Uh, those would always be in the vendor community anyway. Uh, but that, that was our strategy, is to make sure that we have a good handoff point where we feel like we've got good ownership of the design and we've had an opportunity uh, for the Boeing team to become familiar with it so they could operate it. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I understand what you're doing. And, uh, it sounds like you're doing everything you can do, but it, it's, in my experience, a, a dangerous step. So you, it's going to take a lot of watching for uh, yeah. uh, in that regard. It's, it's particularly it's particularly interesting now. Uh, we're at the point of detailed process specs: um, how you put a common bulkhead together, uh, what are, what's our bonding procedures, and all of those things. Uh, we hold a lot of that work in house, so that it's a that it's a NASA product that we're putting out there. Um, and I recognize some of the pitfalls in there. Um, we're working, we're trying to guard those so that those are um, government products uh, that, that will be held by the government uh, and, uh, and understand the issues. I guess the concern is that uh, once you have even a proven data package from one source, in this case the government, uh, there are usually a lot of surprises when it comes to, I guess you just have to allow time and we hope effort so. to work through those. I, let's see, I heard, I, let's see, I saw Bo first, and then I'll come to you, Charlie. Yeah. I have a question that is really, uh, it's not my question, but it came for, to me uh, from a gentleman that I trust, who, who trusts immensely his engineering judgment, and I couldn't answer it. So I'll see if, uh, if, if Brett, if he's still around, if you can answer it. And the and, uh, discussion went like this. He says, you know, uh, we carried wings and tail on orbiter through, a, through ascent, which, by the way, designed those things so we can land, so we can enter and land. We have carried uh, parachutes, flotation devices, heat shield to the moon, so we can use it for last, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes of this mission. And his question was, the gear ratio, as you guys call it, you know, how much do you have to launch to Leo so you can actually get to Mars? He said, is carry all that stuff all the way to Mars the only way to go to Mars for humans? Okay, so say your last statement You have again. to take parachutes and... Right. flotation devices and 
and he chilled all the way to Martian orbit, so you can, they, two years later, use it, uh, you know, for the last 30 minutes of the mission while you enter. Right, okay, so you got a, you got a couple options. Um, at the end of the mission, you either, you, you got the crew living in a transit habitat that's been designed to keep them alive for a minimum of 400 days and in a contingency up to 900 days. So it's a, a fairly sizable element, the transit habitat. Um, if you didn't want to take all those systems for a direct Earth entry, you'd have to stop those systems in Earth orbit. And at the end of a Mars trajectory, you've got a lot of energy that you've got to get rid of, which means you've got to take propellant to slow yourself down so that you can rendezvous, which is, I think that's where you're going, so you can rendezvous with something in Earth orbit. So that means you have one way or the other, you've either got to take the propellant to slow yourself down at the end of the mission, or our preferred approach is to direct Earth entry of the crew at the end of the mission which means you try to minimize the size of the system, which leads us to things like not wanting wings and things, but instead a small capsule, which has a limited life of two to three days to keep the crew alive with parachutes. And Orion fits that bill. A derivative of Orion fits right in with that. Charlie. <clears throat> I'd like to follow up a little bit on uh, Chris's uh, remarks about whether or not there is a fundamental limitation due to radiation exposure uh, to human expeditions in deep space. And it's probably early times to answer that question. Um, one of the unknowns, I'm told, is uh, on the biomedical side, whereby uh, research uh, could end up with two possible benefits. One is risk clarification and risk differentiation amongst subjects. On the one hand, and the other possibility is, of course, uh, uh, remediation and mitigation of radiation exposure. And so uh, it would seem to me that uh, if the country is going to spend tens of billions of dollars over the next decade building exploration systems, uh, it might be willing to spend 10 to the minus 3 of that on a serious program to clarify these risks. Uh, before we let them make a significant impact on the design reference uh, and uh, other engineering decisions that you might make uh, on, the, on the physics and engineering side. And it's probably the case that over the 10 years in which our, I would bet at least personally, that over the 10 years in which our systems, engineering systems are being developed, that clarification will come in and be a better way of informing the choices you have for exploration afterwards. Would someone care to respond to that? I, I think your point is, is, is right on in terms of the fundamental research of the humans and the biological effects um, and following those protocols and understanding how humans behave is, is critical. And I think you're right that we need some fundamental research in that area. Um, from an engineering perspective, we're trying to follow all of the mission design system design protocols in order to minimize that, but getting the biological behavior to those systems and characterizing the environment. A lot of what's driving us is the uncertainty in the environment, um, and getting those measurements so we understand better the environment is also critical. Do you want to add something? Yeah, just to, just to follow on, uh, we also have a, a, a part of the exploration portfolio in, in, in the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate is a human research program. And what we, could, what we could offer to the committee is to provide you more background on what that program is doing to, on the uh, human health uh, protection and countermeasures with, re, with respect to radiation and any other aspect of the life sciences a, a sub -team component to this uh, mission. consisting of Chris and myself got a, probably an inadequate briefing, and I would appreciate learning more. But yes. uh, we, yeah. And uh, Mr. Dr. Greeson here. imaginable fact. Well, and, and, and so we'll owe you that, and then, and then I think you're also coming at it, if I'm understanding your questions, uh, from, a, from a vehicle design engineering perspective, assuming that there is this constraint on the human, how are we going to protect them? Yeah, and the question will be, you know, how will that constraint look in 10 years when you also have to make other design decisions? Absolutely, absolutely. Just to clarify that, it was a very good briefing, but I think it's clear there's other information we, we, could, we could get. 
we're now well briefed on what we don't know. Um, I have a question for Steve Cook, but I want to start with an editorial comment. I've reached a new first. I, I just heard Orion referred to as a small capsule. Um, that's a first. Uh, the, the question I have is relates to something Steve said earlier this morning. It's been chewing in my brain. And I'm paraphrasing it, so I'll doubtless get the, the, the sentence wrong. But it was something like, you know, we're turning NASA, our NASA people from, from researchers and operators into producers. Um, and I hear that, and I'm going, why is this good? Because, you know, the nation has people who make manufacturing drawings, and it has people who build hardware for a living. But we only have one space agency that does our forward-looking research and our, our deep in-space operations and, you know, mission controllers that bring Apollo 13 home. But we're not going to go out, we're not going to outsource that. So why is this uh, stipulated that it's a good thing to do the job you're asked to do, perhaps? Why is it a good thing from a national policy perspective to do it that way? So let me give you a couple of perspectives on that. Um, first off, when I, when I talk about, if you look at the, the history of NASA's culture up until we started this project, we were either largely focused, now I'll, I'll really talk about Marshall Space Flight Center because that's where I've got most of my background. Uh, we either had a large cadre of folks involved in the oversight of a largely operational program, space shuttle and space station, all right, with the, with the engineering that, the, and scrutiny that goes into doing that. Uh, and what that typically implies is you're, you're there grading paper, all right, and, and you're solving problems, you know, when, when problems come up, but there's a lot, of, a lot of paper grading that goes on with that. We also had, uh, and this is the side of the world I came up on, the research and technology side where we were working on advanced technology solutions which may one day find themselves into something. So that's my, that's my background, that's what I came up through. What we're trying to do, and what we've been doing for the last four years, is trying to find a good blend of those two cultures such that we get the, the government team more in the line of putting out a product. Now, that product doesn't necessarily mean a drawing. That is one form of product. When I talk about product, I mean like the lock stamper you saw. Turning that from a, from a very, very conceptual research project into something that could actually be flown, that's engineering. That's what the center was, was largely founded on doing, and that's, that's the kind of mentality we want to get back in the game because we hadn't been in a large-scale development mode in a long period of time. So it's more the culture of, of, of people being willing to produce a product and put it out. Now, we can, we could, we can make argument of whether, you know, is doing a design drawing something that, that you really want the government to do. Okay, as a part of walking through and building up that culture, we decided that that was a good demarcation point for the upper stage. We're not using that on the other stages. But, and then when we get to Aries 5, I don't see us going to that point either. So that's part of going back up that curve. So the final state of putting out a model and verifying it, no, that's not where we're really trying to get to. What, I'm trying to, what we've been trying to do is get a, a product mentality versus either checking somebody's paper or just working on things that may never fly. Okay, so it's bringing that culture back in versus um, I'm, I don't intend to see the government becoming a... Uh, final end item producer from here on out. That's not really where we uh, plan to take this. Yeah, and Jeff? I just want to I just want to add, I, I think what you're also watching us do is reinvigorate large-scale systems engineering in NASA. And it's something that had atrophied over the years and, d and the DOD found a similar a similar phenomena going on through the 90s. And, and getting back to doing systems engineering, and that's taking it from concept through to execution is one of the things that, that this program is trying to embody. Now, we, as, as Steve says, we won't be able to do that the way we're doing it today for on Aries 1 and Orion. We won't be able to do that for this entire portfolio of work. But it's making us smart buyers in the future. And I think that's important for, uh, for the agency. So. Well, thank you all very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, we will talk more tomorrow about the program of CAPE and uh, better move ahead to our, our next. Uh, thank you very thank much. You.